Okay, everybody, welcome back. In this particular section, in section 4.2, we're going to focus on identifying the shapes of our distributions using terms like symmetry and skewness. We'll make sense of what those mean. So let's go ahead and jump right in. The bottom line is it's helpful to be able to describe the shape of our distribution because then we know how the scores in the distribution are spread out. So imagine that we collected a bunch of data regarding our exam scores. If we understand the shape of the distribution and I tell you that the scores were positively skewed, we should understand what that means in terms of how the scores are spread out. You'll understand that very shortly. So let me make one point first. In the real world, our data usually isn't really pretty. We, we almost never find perfectly normal distributions like this smooth line represents. Um, our data is usually somewhat jagged. And just for today, for instructional purposes, I'll be showing you these smooth lines so we can better understand the key characteristics of these shapes of distributions. So let's first describe distributions of data in terms of their peaks. The peaks represent the modes because you might recall a peak in a data set and we're more, we're more used to seeing those normal distributions that have those humps. That hump represents most people scoring in that area. So let's say that we're looking at this y-axis here. Remember it always represents frequencies, so I'll put an F there for a second. And this x-axis, you'll recall, always represents the actual scores. So let's say we're dealing with exam scores that can go from 0 to 100. This is a really strange distribution then because it's showing the same number of people scoring at each level from 0 all the way to 100. So the same number of people scored 5, for example, as scored 100. That's very, very strange. We would call this distribution uh, a uniform or flat distribution for obvious reasons. There's no mode. There's no one value that occurred more frequently than another. All values occurred with the same frequency. Let's just say that frequency equals 5. So 5 people scored a 1, 5 people scored a 2, and so forth. That's very, very rare, particularly for something like exam scores. I don't think ever collecting data um, with something like an exam score, some type of naturally occurring performance measure, you know, like intelligence, would you ever see some type of flat distribution. So let's look at something that's a little bit more common. Here we've got what we call a unimodal distribution because we can see there's one mode, here's one peak. Remember what we're trying to do right now is just focus on peaks. So there's one mode, we can see right up here. So if, again, if we're looking at exam scores between 0 and 100, let's just say that mode is right here around the score of 50. So most people scored a 50, which probably wouldn't be very good on an exam. This, by the way, is a normal distribution. That bell-shaped curve that you've probably heard about before is what we in statistics actually call a normal distribution. And what we're finding in a normal distribution is that the scores will mostly pile up around some type of center, some type of average score, and we will have far fewer people who score high and far fewer people who score low. And again, remember, this axis always represents the frequencies. So we see that lots of people were scoring right over here, but because the line is very shallow right over here, very low on this y-axis, very few people scored low on the exam very few people scored really high on the exam. So that's unimodal for right now because we're focusing on peaks. That just means there's one mode. Let's look at another distribution. You see how this one's a little bit strange. If we were looking at exam scores, and remember this axis always represents the frequencies. This is gonna represent our exam scores from zero to 100. Here we'd see one mode over here, like lots of people were scoring somewhere around 30. And then lots of people over here were scoring around 80. Now, we would call this bimodal. There are two modes, two distinct peaks. You can see they're not equal. They don't have to be exactly equal for us to say that a distribution is bimodal. I mean, don't you agree? It, it would be kind of crazy for us to completely ignore this peak because it's not as high as this peak. So here we would have a bimodal distribution and that lots of people scored 30 and lots of people scored 80. 
which again would be kind of strange. It would be kind of strange that lots of people are scoring really low scores and high scores. Again, it's much more normal that we see a normal distribution with one peak. All right, so that's bimodal. Let's look at another distribution. This is a distribution that we would call trimodal because let's count the peaks. We see one peak here, so lots of people are scoring really low. A lot of people scored right here in the center, and then a lot of people scored really high. So it's trimodal or, or maybe multimodal, we might say. And again, even if the peaks are somewhat unequal, we're just trying to find actual peaks that are sticking out. And this is relatively rare here as well, particularly with exam scores. It'd be very unlikely that I would find a distribution like this. But we're trying to learn some of the terminology to describe distributions. So if I were to come back in class and tell you I measured something and I found a multimodal distribution, you should be seeing something like this in your head. You'd probably ask me like, oh, well, where were those modes over what values so that you can have a better understanding of how the data was distributed. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about these distributions. And let's talk about if a distribution is symmetrical or skewed. Now, symmetrical distributions essentially mirror one side with the other side. Skewed distributions have more variation. Let's talk about symmetry for a minute. Symmetry is beautiful. In social psychology, when we look at a person's face, you can see that Denzel Washington has almost perfect symmetry. If you were to cut his face right down the middle, and compare one side with the other, you'd see almost perfect symmetry. And people find symmetry very attractive. Look at this face. This face has not much symmetry at all. One side of Lyle Lovett's face looks very different from the other. And that's one reason why we don't find him very attractive. Yet somehow he was able to marry Julia Roberts. Let's talk about the whole symmetry issue as it applies to distributions. Here's a nice pretty distribution. It has perfect symmetry. And again, this is that normal distribution. If I were to cut it right down the middle, one side of the distribution looks like the other. So how many people scored around the B level? Same number as scored around the D level. How many people scored around the A level? Same number of people who scored around the F level. Perfect symmetry. Again, here's a distribution with perfect symmetry. It's not a normal distribution like this one, but one side looks just like the other. We've got the same number of people scoring in this particular region as there is in this particular region. Here we have that multimodal distribution, but it is still symmetrical. If I were to cut it right down the middle, one side looks like the other. So this would be pretty rare, but we're just trying to understand the terminology, symmetry essentially mirror images. Now let's look at skewed distributions. Skewed distributions, like normal distributions, are pretty common. In a skewed distribution, we have more variability on one side of the distribution. Like you see how these are so spread out compared to the other side of the distribution. And in this case, when I'm talking about sides, I'm kind of splitting it up right where our peak is, right where that mode is. So some people would call this left skewed. Do you see how like this tail of the distribution, if I were to make it an arrow, is pointing toward the left? And do you see how this distribution, if I were to make the tail into an arrow, would be pointing toward the right? So we have a left skew, here we have a right skew. This is also known as a negative skew, and this is also known as a positive skew. In fact, that's the terminology that I tend to use, but our textbook uses left skew and right skew, and it's, it's kind of easier to remember that. You can remember negative skew because on any normal number line, you know, at some point we have zero, at some point we have high numbers, high positive numbers. Well, over here we've got negative numbers, so it's pointing toward the negative point of the number line. And again, here we've got zero, here we've got high positive numbers, back over here somewhere we have negative numbers. You can see how this distribution, its tail, the tail of the distribution is pointing toward the positive numbers, positive skew. All right, well, let's make sure we understand how each measure of central tendency would be affected by this type of skew, either type of skew. And this is important because if we understand the measures of central tendency, we will see why it makes sense to choose one measure over another when we have skewed data because we'll be able to see how the different measures react. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Imagine what's going on here. It's always easy to figure out where our mode is because we just simply look at our peak 
So when we look at the peak, we can see most people scored right here. So whatever this value is, remember this is a number line, like from 0 to, we've been using 100 as the highest value. The modal value is right here, somewhere around, let's say, maybe 85. Then, remember, because our distribution is showing some people scored over here, some people scored really low, right? I mean, these are scores like 10 and 5, and we can see that a few people are scoring in this range. Well, you might recall when we have outliers like that, when we have a few of these really low scores, what's going to happen to our mean? Our mean is going to be really highly affected by that. So this line right here is showing where our mean would probably be. Now our median is still the midpoint, but when we have a skewed distribution, that midpoint can't just be found by looking at the hump, by looking at the peak. That midpoint still needs to show where half of the scores are above in value and half the scores are below in value. But remember that median is not affected like the mean is by these outliers. So our median among the three different measures of central tendency would typically be found in the middle in this type of situation. So let's label that. In this case, we've got our mode right over here. We've got our mean, which is very influenced, the most influenced of the three measures by these outlier scores. And then our median somewhere in the middle, less influenced than the mean. We would find the opposite type of distribution of these measures when we have a positive skew or a right skew. Again, it's always easy to find our mode because we just look for our peak. So this value right in here is the most frequently occurring value. Let's just say it's a value of something like 20. And then again, because we have, we have a few of these scores, you can see the distribution is not very high, so it represents a, a small number of frequencies compared to our mode. Here's a high number of frequencies. Many people scored 20. Not many people here scored 90. But because we have some of this outlier data in here, our mean is going to be most affected by that. Our, our median is not affected by these high values, but because we still need to split the distribution in half, when we find that midpoint, we're going to find that our median is somewhere in here. So I'll label that real quickly. This is the type of distribution of measures of central tendency that we would find when we have a positive skew or a right skew. Our mode would be at the peak, our mean would be most influenced and pushed out toward the right, and our median would be somewhere there in the middle. So our mean is always chasing the outliers. When we have a right skew, our mean is chasing those outliers out to the right. When we have a left skew, our mean is chasing those outliers out to the left. It's very influenced by them. Now, the, the beautiful thing about a symmetrical distribution, a normal distribution like this one, is that right there in the middle, it's easy enough to find our mode, but that's exactly where you'll also find the mean and the median. So when we have a normal distribution, in fact, when we have a symmetrical distribution, our mode, our mean, and our median will always be exactly the same. So I just want to make sure that you understand how the different measures of central tendency will react when we have a skew, whether it's left or right, and when we have a symmetric distribution. Let's talk a little bit more about kind of estimating what kind of shape we think we might find. And if we just think about these measures, we can probably get a sense of what we might find. So would you expect the following distributions to be symmetric, left skewed, or right skewed? GPAs from a sample of 1,000 OU students. Well, keep in mind, when we're talking about a normal distribution, let me just draw that picture. A normal distribution, of course, it would be a little bit smoother. The reason why we call it a normal distribution is because most naturally occurring things that we measure, like people's um, intelligence, their performance in school, normally we tend to see a distribution that looks like that, where most people's scores fall right around some midpoint in here. We have very few people who score really high and few people who score really low. When we're talking about something like GPAs, this is something that's performance-based, it's intelligence-based, it's relatively naturally occurring. So it's likely that we'd probably find a normal distribution. It's likely to be symmetric. Why would we necessarily think there are going to be more A's than there are um, D's and F's and things like that? It's probably going to be roughly symmetric. That would be my guess. You know, this, this is something that's open for debate, of course, but we're just trying to kind of estimate what we would find here. Symmetric distributions, left skewed or right skewed. In this particular case, I'm thinking that we would find a symmetric distribution.
But now here's a big difference here when we're talking about annual incomes from a sample of 1,000 graduates. So again, let's just kind of put our axes in there. I might have mentioned this previously, but when we're dealing with things like money, things that are income-based, we often have outliers involved because in a normal distribution, you know, we would find maybe that most people are scoring some type of average income in life um, and that they're going to be earning upon graduation something like thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. But there will be some people who, who've done really well for themselves and they'll have some really high salaries. So remember, here are the high positive values. So these are high positive values. And here are the lower positive values on any number line. So if we're talking about money, we might find that, you know, most people are scoring right around here, whether that's, you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, but there are still some people who are really earning a lot of money. And do you see how here we have a skewed distribution? And the skew is pointing toward the right. So here we have a right skew, a right skew, also known as a positive skew. That's what I would predict. So I would list that as the best estimate here because we would probably find that most people are grouping up somewhere around some reasonable salary, but we're likely to have some people who have a really high salary and that's going to affect the distribution. Not many of those people have a really high salary. That's why we call them outliers. They're not like the rest. And of course, that would really affect the mean when we have those outliers. That's why whenever we're talking about things like money, we almost always select as a basic measure of central tendency, the median. And that's because that median wouldn't be influenced by the outliers like the mean. If we were to compute the mean, you know, the mean is going to be somewhere in here. It's going to be offset by these extreme scores. But that median, again, it's just going to be that middle point. So it's going to be somewhere around here, relatively close to that modal value. Let's talk a little bit here before we, we end things about how we can, we can use these distributions to estimate variation. And when we're talking about variation, we're talking about how widely the scores are spread out. So if we're using the shape to estimate variation, what we're essentially doing is, is looking to see how far are the scores spread out. So remember, this axis is always representing frequencies, and this axis is always representing actual scores. We've been using exam scores as an example. So let's say those scores can go from 0 to 100. So here we see there, there's quite a bit of variation in those scores, but there might not be as much variation as there is in these scores. And we can see that you know relatively more people were scoring low here, really low, compared to in this distribution over here. And, and do you see how in this distribution, we don't have much variability at all? So again, going from very low scores to very high scores, it looks like almost everybody was scoring somewhere between maybe 50 and 60. See how there's very little variation right here? We've got a lot of variation right here, and maybe somewhere in the middle variation right over here. So let's just kind of um, put those in order. Very little variability, and again, the, the distribution shape shows us that because it's very tight. Here we have moderate variability, I guess. You know, this, this would be a pretty good example of a normal distribution in here. And here we have a lot of variability. I mean, lots of people are scoring relatively low. Lots of people are scoring relatively high. The scores are just really spread out. So when we talk about variability, we're talking about the spread of the scores. This would have the most variability right here. All right, so we're, we're just trying to use those, those shapes that we've been talking about to at least estimate how much variation there might be. Let, let's go through an example, just like where we're kind of thinking about the concepts where, again, we can estimate some variability. So how would you expect the variation in running times to differ between Olympic marathon runners and runners in the New York City Marathon? Let's think about this for a second. If we're looking at running times of Olympic marathon runners, haven't those people already really proven themselves to be great runners? I mean, they are elite runners. So when they run a race in the Olympics, their times are all going to probably be pretty darn high, right? I mean, we're not going to have slackers in the Olympics, or at least not many of them. But now when we're looking at the New York City Marathon, 
Well, there are lots of people who are professionals, professional athletes who are running in that, but aren't there also a lot of amateurs? And there might be some people that might be their first marathon. So I would expect to find lots of variability. So for the New York City Marathon, I'm going to find some scores, some running times that are really low. I mean, those are really fast runners, great elite runners. But I'm going to find some running times that are really high as well. In fact, there might be lots of people who don't even finish because they're just not even in shape for a marathon. I'm not going to find nearly that much variability when I'm looking at the Olympic marathon. I would expect to find almost all those times to be very low. And of course, what's going to distinguish between the gold, the silver, and the bronze might just be even a few seconds. So this would sum up the answer, I think, pretty well. Sorry that my writing is in the, in the way. The Olympic marathon includes elite runners only, whose times are likely to be clustered near world record speeds. The New York City Marathon includes runners of all abilities, so the variation among their times would certainly be greater. So we should be able to estimate that, the amount of variability in scores, if we at least know something about those measurements that we're taking. So oftentimes it's just based on common sense. All right, I think we've talked about that enough today. So that, my friends, really is the key content from section 4.2. For now, that is all.